But in the Advent season, I always make an exception because the themes are so great. And the theme is peace today. And if you would like to open your Bible or your Bible app and go to Isaiah chapter 9, that's where I'm going to hang out for a while. <clears throat> when I get into this season of the year, there's a lot of wonderful memories for me. Um, <clears throat> One that went through my mind when I was working on this message was my grandfather, who didn't come to the Lord until he was about 63 years of age. Uh, he also was in that interesting period of time where Social Security had just been created about three years before he retired. And I've always taken great comfort in the fact that if I don't ever get even with the Social Security Administration, my grandfather did. He paid in for three years and then managed to milk it for 31. <laughs> Not a bad deal. He was 96 when he left this world. And I can remember him <clears throat> when I was a, a youngster uh, standing up in church. We had an interesting little church in this community that... Uh, I suspect the Quakers were a little bit like us. We didn't have a pastor because, we, like you guys, we were looking for one. And so many times the service was kind of free-flowing. And we would do this thing where people would just share whatever was on their heart. And my grandfather, at 80, 88 years of age probably, uh, he would stand up and he would take this little paperback hymnal that we had and he would clear his throat and he would start singing far away in the depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than psalms some of you know that in celestial light strains it unceasingly fails or my soul like an infinite calm Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. Really, that's a wonderful memory for me. I'm about 11 years old and I'm looking at this man who's really old to me. At this point in life, that doesn't look too old. He's kind of young, I think. <laughs> uh, and I took away a number of things from that. But one of them I did not take away at 11 years of age is, okay, why is this song so important to you, Grandpa? Well... He was born in the period of the Old West. He actually knew Cole Younger and people who were members of Jesse James's gang. And he lived a very tumultuous life till he was 63. My dad said that Grandpa could chew Copenhagen, dip snuff, and smoke a cigarette all at the same time. And one day, my grandma, who had come to the Lord at the age of 18, and she was grandpa's second wife, because his first wife had died of tuberculosis in Missouri. Uh, she said that she had just cleaned a window over the sink in their cabin up in northern Washington. And uh, he didn't realize the window was closed, and he spit his tobacco out what he thought was a window. And my dad says he remembers Grandpa looking at that window and going, turning to my dad and saying, your angel mother just had to clean the windows. <laughs> so that was the kind of life he had for 60-some years. And then he met Jesus. Peace. Well, if I'm not careful, I will share all kinds of stuff with you that you probably don't need to hear. 
but about eight centuries before the angel band sang to the shepherds outside of Bethlehem. I always called that the heavenly light show. <clears throat> Isaiah wrote these words. And we'll pick it up at verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You will multiply the nation, and you will increase their gladness with your presence, as with the gladness of harvest, and as men would rejoice when they divide the spoils. You will break the yoke of their burden, and the staff on their shoulders. I'm down to verse 6 now. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government shall rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. Fast forward about eight centuries to Bethlehem, and you will hear the angelic messengers declare, Glory to God in the highest. This is in Luke 2, verse 14, if you want to go there. And on earth, peace among men with whom he, meaning God, is pleased. The angelic messenger told the shepherds not to be afraid. Good news. The child of Isaiah 9 eight centuries earlier, is going to be born. The king and the prince of promised peace had arrived. I want to put Isaiah 9 in context for you. Verse 1, which we did not read, tells us that there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. It then says something that kind of seems enigmatic or mysterious in nature when it, it, it says in earlier times he, meaning the Lord had treated the land of Zebulun and Naphtali with contempt but later he will make it glorious by way of the sea on the other side of Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles and, and you kind of want to stop and I, I, maybe you don't but I, I look at it and I go oh, no, what's that there for and if you go to a Bible atlas and look up the maps of the time in which Isaiah prophesied, and juxtapose that next to a map of the time of Jesus, you know what you find out about Zebulun and Naphtali? That's where Jesus grew up. Because Nazareth is right in the middle of those two regions. And the interesting thing about Zebulun and Naphtali, or the region of Galilee in the time of Christ, is that it was known as a, a place of questionable character. Uh, now, no offense to anybody from the Ozarks, because I lived in the Ozarks for a little while, and I loved it. But I will tell you that the people that live in the mountains of the Ozarks are a unique people. They have an unusual way of phrasing the king's English. I happen to like it, but, you know. And when I was there, I, I was staying there for a while, and uh, I was all of the ripe old age of 15. And the family I was hanging out with one day said, you talk funny. I said, I talk funny? And they said, yeah, you, you talk educated. I'm 15, how much education could I have? And then finally, Aunt Goldie looked at me, she said, you know, you sound like an Englishman. And I thought, hmm, apparently Californians do have an accent. My kids are living in Texas, part of them. Some of them are living in South Carolina. And they're beginning to develop an accent. So to say that the Ozarks are unique is not an unfair statement. Something else known about the Ozarks, much of it brought on by little Abner 
you know, the cartoon strip and some of the stuff that's gone on in the movies, you know, the old movies that are made about the feuding going on in, in, in the, the hill country, has spun kind of an image of ignorant hicks, you know, with teeth missing and weird kind of music that they make on single stringed instruments and you know, washboards. You know where I'm going with this, right? Well, that's kind of the cultural context that the people in Judea, that would be Jerusalem and that neck of the woods, that was their view of Galilee. Galileans talked funny. Galileans weren't known to be exactly in the upper crust of society. Now, it was probably an unfair analysis, but one of the common cliches of the time and in fact, one of the men that Jesus called to be a disciple, when they told him this guy was from Nazareth, his statement was, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? So there's this sense in which Isaiah says, yeah, the land of Zebulon and Naphtali has been treated with contempt, viewed as of little value. That's really what the Hebrew word means almost worthless, beneath consideration, poor white trash. You pick the cliche from our modern context, and that's what Isaiah was trying to get across. He said, but wait. I'm getting blessed about something I can't even talk about yet. <laughs> wait. God will make them glorious. And that's good news, folks. Because it doesn't matter how lousy you think you are or how questionable your origins are. I, this is really not in my sermon. I'm headed in a direction I didn't know I was going to go. I, I sat and listened to Dr. Raines, who was a clinical psychologist that taught at Mid-America at Nazarene University. He's the only psychologist I've ever heard who could preach. And he shared this story one time. He was in a conference, and at this conference that he was talking at, there was a, a woman that sat down in front, and all the time he was talking, and he was talking about how the devil lies to us about who we are and what we are. This woman sat with her face in her, on her knees, sobbing quietly. Now, I don't know about you, but I couldn't put my face on my knees if I wanted to. But apparently she could. And he said, it was so troubling to me. He said, I, I'm, I'm speaking, and as I spoke, she, he said, I could just tell she was devastated. And he said, I couldn't understand what was going on. But at the end of that session, he said, she was still there crying, and everybody had left the room, and it was lunchtime, and I felt like I needed to leave the room and go to lunch. And he said, I'm not real comfortable sitting with a woman by herself. So he said, I made a beeline for the door. And he said, I got to the doors of the conference room, and the Holy Spirit just stopped me. You go back and talk to her. He said, I felt so awkward. I went back and sat down and I put my hand on her shoulder. I said, pal. He said, don't ask me why I said pal. But he said, I couldn't think of anything else to say. Pal, tell me why. You're crying. What's going on with you? And out of her broken sobs, he finally got a story that she had been born illegitimately. Didn't know who her parents were and felt that she was literally a mistake that didn't belong in this world. And he said, in a moment of divine inspiration, I looked at her and I said, do you believe the Bible? And she said, I do. He said, do you believe what the Bible says about God? I do. Do you believe then that God is ever present everywhere at all times? I do. Do you believe he's omnipotent, that he can do anything he wants? Yes. Do you believe he's all-knowing, omniscient? Well, of course. He said, then, young lady, I submit to you that when you were conceived, God knew about it, and he had the power to stop it, and he didn't stop it, and therefore he knows that you are entirely legitimate by his will. Zebulun and Naphtali, illegitimate. And God says, no, I'm going to bring my Messiah 
right out of that part of the world. Born in Bethlehem, but raised in Nazareth. Didn't anybody tell God that being raised in Nazareth was a bad idea? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, yes, the Prince of Peace can come out of Nazareth. So I don't know what your background is, but brothers and sisters, we are all legitimate by God's sovereign decree. Or you wouldn't be here. And you should rejoice in that. Okay, that was for free. <clears throat> what happens to these illegitimate people, though, is this incredible freedom. And, and he, Dr. Rain said that this, this woman just sat there and looked at him and went, Oh, my goodness. And he said, I watched the joy of the Lord just go over her. He said the rest of that conference, she was in there. He said, what a simple thing to be able to share with somebody. What a gloriously profound freedom it brought. He said the gladness in her was just overwhelming. Well, what does it say? These people who are walking in this darkness, you will increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence with a gladness as of harvest, like men who rejoice when they divide the spoils. You know what spoils are. That's, that's what you, you... Well, today we don't have wars and then collect the goodies from our enemies, but maybe it'd be like winning the lottery or something. I don't know. But I understand that gladness. I came to Susanville Church of the Nazarene in 1992. In June, the church had to double the pay they were giving me to match a very small fraction of what I was making in my previous church. But it was double what the previous pastor had been receiving that I followed. They gave me a whole $225 a week. I had three kids. The board looked at me and said, we know this isn't enough and we understand you may have to work. What do you think you'll do for a living? I said, well, I think I'll cut firewood. Which was interesting because the previous guy didn't even like to burn firewood, let alone cut it. But I was raised in a timber family, so for me it was no big deal. And I cut and sold firewood. Still wasn't quite enough. And so December rolls around, and I had this interesting thing of being flat broke. And... The district had had me do some work for them, and in the process of doing the work, I'd spent some of my own money. I was involved in the district in a position with youth at the time. And so I needed a reimbursement from the district treasurer for a whole $150. Jesus is calling. I don't know who it is or what it is. Did, did you find him? <laughs> Reminds me of another old gospel song, Jesus on the main line, tell him what you want. <laughs> so, I was waiting for this $150 reimbursement check, which in my world was a lot of money at that moment. And unbeknownst to me, the district secretary thought they'd mailed it and they had lost it in a stack of mail on their desk. And I had waited and waited and called. And, oh, it should have been there. And so I'm waiting for this check because, and this is, the Lord knows this is true. My family wasn't going to have food if I didn't have that check. And I'd already told my kids two of whom were old enough to know exactly what was going on, that we would not be doing Christmas. And I know people say, well, why didn't you talk to the church about that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the church board was posting the bills of the church on a bulletin board and begging people to pay them. That's how tough things were. So, I'm not asking the church because they don't have any money. 
You know the old story about turnips. Can't squeeze a turnip. Well, you can, but you won't get much out of it. So I was going to the mailbox every day and checking for this check. I remember walking to the mailbox and opening it up and reaching in. And there was the envelope from the district treasurer. I opened it up. There was $150. I'm saying, thank you, Lord, just in time. And then there was a Christmas card in there. And the Christmas card was from a lady who had just started attending our church about a month before. And it was addressed to the church and to me. I said, oh, Christmas card, how nice. I opened the Christmas card up. Now I'm already a little lighter in my heart because I'm going to feed the family. I opened the card up and inside the card were two checks. One for the church for $4,000. Put it in perspective, that was 10% of the annual income of the church right there. And the other check was to me for $150. And I was glad. Because I've gone from nothing to double. <laughs> double or nothing, you know. You, you know that phrase around here. And as I'm standing there thanking the Lord for $150, it's like there's something in the back of my brain that says, you need to look at that check again. I looked at it again, and I had dropped to zero. It was $1,500. That's pretty good money even today. 30 years later. I cannot tell you how I felt. But gladness probably doesn't even cover it. I stood there in front of the mailbox weeping. Now in 1974, similar Christmas memory. I was working for a company as a high climber. I told you I worked in the trees. I have the scars to prove that. And uh, I was running from God's call to the ministry in 74. <laughs> by the way, you can run from God, but he's so stinking fast. You, you, by the time you think you've gotten away from him, there he is. But I'm running from God's call and I'm working in the trees. I'm a high climber and a faller. And I'm working for a company that had promised me, yeah, you're not going to get much pay but we'll give you profit sharing at the end of the year. And so I was banking on that, and it's December, and the big boss comes around, and you know what he does? He lays me off. In fact, he was such a rascal, he laid off everybody he was going to have to pay profit sharing to. We just don't have the business, we're going to lay you off. And I faced Christmas that year, just my wife and I, with no money. It's that season. By the way, don't forget... You got people all around you that are crashing and burning today. In the season when it ought to be joy and peace and hope, it's totally a despair for them because they have family that's gone, they have people they love that are deceased, they don't know where they're going to be spending all this time, they hear all these happy songs and they go, that might be happy, but my life stinks. And it just kind of compounds the contrasting for them. More suicide this time of year than any other time of year. And I was so angry at being deprived and cheated. I carried the bitterness of that until seven years later, I finally surrendered to God's call to go into the ministry. The difference between 1974 and 1992 was in 92... I knew I was exactly where God had called me, doing exactly what he had called me to do. And I had the certainty of that. And even if there was no money, it didn't make any difference. I was where God had asked me to be, doing what he had called me to do. And when you're in God's will, his guarantee is to take care of you. He will meet your needs. And by the way, sometimes when you're out of his will, he'll meet your needs, because I'm pretty sure when I was running from him, or a few times he bailed me out when I didn't deserve it. But what happened in 1992, while I was concerned, 
there was a sense of peace. Lord, here I am doing what you asked me to do. I don't know where you're at today, but if you are where God has asked you to be and you're in a tough spot, it's okay. See, the Hebrew word for peace is very simple and can be summed up in one word that we use. Not enough, but we do use it. Undisturbed. That's peace. Undisturbed. Think about that a moment. I've got to turn the page on my notes. I forgot about them. When you think God has forgotten you and you think that you're nothing, God hasn't forgotten you and you are something because you are part of his design. He intended you. His purpose was for you. And here's the sad thing about it. If you don't do you, you don't get done. And God has every purpose for you. Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 that when he made it possible for you to be saved by grace, he didn't save you because you did good works. He saved you because he had good works for you to do. It says right there, you were his workmanship, created in him with good works for you to do before the foundation of the world. Oh, by the way, that's a good reason to be against abortion. God has many babies who had good works to do and never got to do them. You ever wondered if, and I'm not castigating anybody for this, I understand there's a lot of pain and difficulty behind that whole conversation. So don't take this as condemnation. Just take this as, hey, think about this. There's somebody that didn't get to be who may have found the cure for cancer or may have led others to Christ or may have offered the world something that we never dreamed of because God in his infinite creativity creates within every child, every baby, every being he has conceived by his sovereign will a purpose and a plan. And so no matter where you're at today, and no matter how much your life hasn't gone the way you thought it should go, if you right this moment will take this opportunity to ask the Lord to set you on the course he has for you, I can guarantee you, you will find a great deal of peace. And you can do that while I'm talking. We don't have to stop and have this big introspective moment. You can turn to the Lord in your heart right now. You don't even have to, you know, listen to me anymore. Just listen to the Holy Spirit. So in Isaiah 9, this child has a number of titles. Hmm. Oh, I, I need to put this in here. Uh, I, I, I jumped over something I, I do want to share. Where the Lord has placed you, his light will shine on you, even in a place of gloom. Isaiah says that to us. David wrote it this way. Many are saying, who will show us any good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when grain and new wine abound. In peace, I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, have made me to dwell in safety. Jesus has a number of names given to him by Isaiah. If you will, you can look at all of them. We don't have the time to look at all of them today. Some of you are going, oh, thank goodness. <clears throat> but I do want to look at the last one, Prince of Peace, for just a few moments. I've already told you the Hebrew word there for peace is undisturbed. And, and you know, there's, there's other words you can put in there. Uh, troubled. In fact, uh, if, if you were to go look in a Webster's Dictionary or an Oxford Dictionary, I don't know what the dictionary online does. I've noticed something. The dictionary online has some really weird definitions in it nowadays that don't even fit anything that I ever grew up with. Just telling you. And they've kind of spun the meaning of some words. We're going to stick with old and proven Webster. 
troubled or public tumult is what disturbed is. We'll talk about what disturbed is so we can get to undisturbed. How about this? Scuffles and brawls. Oh my goodness, did anybody see the news this morning? I watched it just a couple moments. Some crazy nutcase in New York just comes running up behind a, a pedestrian just walking by and starts beating him with a bat. I don't even know if the person survived. Uh, commo uh, commotions, intrusions, interruptions, mental disorders, unbalanced. These are all words that fit into the word disturbed. So undisturbed means no trouble, no public tumult, no scuffles, no brawls, no commotion, no intrusion, no interruption, no mental disorders, no unbalanced. No, it doesn't mean that. <laughs> Jesus said in John 14, as he was leaving his disciples, he said, I have a special gift for you. Peace I leave with you, not as the world gives, but my peace. You see, in the world, we think that peace is no trouble, no tumult, no brawls, no commotions, no intrusions. No in the only way you're going to have no intrusions is go live by yourself as a hermit somewhere on a mountain with no modern devices around you. Because that cell phone you got walking around with you now can intrude all the time. Drive you crazy. Mine has a news feed that comes up on it every morning. There are days that I intentionally don't look at my phone till about lunchtime, just so I don't know what the news is. I don't know about the rest of you, but I can get away with that now that I'm semi-retired. No, Jesus was talking about a peace that's completely different. And Isaiah kind of fills this in by saying to us in Isaiah 26, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is focused on you. Because that person trusts in you. And so in the midst of all the craziness going on, you know, like Antifa disrupting a rally on the sexualization of our children. This is last week's headlines in one of my news feeds. Or the Senate. Senate. <laughs> passing a respect for marriage bill that really forces religious organizations to acknowledge any kind of marriage. You know, I, I heard that somebody wanted to marry their car, and I guess pretty soon we're going to have to accept that too. Uh, or the oil industry executive who warns that another major crisis is coming in the next few weeks. Boy, I'm real happy about that one. Or the vaccinated people make up the majority of the COVID-19 deaths. Well, praise the Lord! You do recognize sarcasm when you hear it. Okay, just want to make sure. Or the bipartisan group of U.S. senators who warn the CCP that they better not try to stop the protests in China. Oh, yeah, I'm sure that'll work. Or a Louisiana attorney general who alleged that Dr. Fauci and Big Tech are censoring American free speech. I, I don't know how that all got put together, but it made a headline. Or that the border is open to all kinds of criminals and criminal activity and the evil, the evil of coerced medicine and people who don't trust science and doctors anymore, and especially those in charge of the CDC, the FBI, the DOJ, or any one of those other three-letter acronym organizations. And some of you are sitting there shaking your heads and nodding your heads and kind of rolling your eyes, and I'm with you. After a little bit, you go, oh, for heaven's sakes, it's insane out there. And the older I get, the nuttier I think people are. <laughs> There's something going on here. I see it. Have we established the ownership of this phone? Who? All right. <laughs> oh, my. So, in the meanwhile, let me bring you back. For unto us a child is born. And unto us a son has been given. Oh, and the government of this world 
will be his responsibility, not ours. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And sometimes we're, we're tempted to advise him, you know, we'd like to point out to you that the government's not doing all that well right at the moment. And I hear the Lord in heaven rolling his eyes and going, I know, I'm trying to give these sinners a little more time to get it right. Do you ever think about God's responsibility? If he loves us the way the Bible says he does, and I absolutely believe he does, then when does he call it enough and everybody that hasn't accepted him dies and goes to hell? And you know, generically speaking, or generally speaking, that might not bother you, but what if it happens to be one of your kids that hasn't accepted Christ and he comes back? Oh, (laughs) when we make it personal, we tend to want to say, wait a little longer, Jesus, wait a little longer, just wait a little longer. You know, people that are into the great escape theology, and I'm not being critical of them or snarky when I say that, there are people that just say, well, let's just solve this by Jesus coming back and we'll all just leave this world and we'll go to heaven. Well, what about all the people that don't know him that are going to go to hell? You see, in our desperation, we're kind of saying to people that are lost, well, you just go to hell because you're inconvenient to my life at this moment. My life is so out of control and so out of peace and so miserable for me that I just want Jesus to come and take me home. Well, okay, well, how about if he just takes you home and leaves the rest of us here a while longer? Well, you know, second coming would be better. Think about that. When does our Heavenly Father who loves us, finally say, okay, son, go get our people. Hmm. I don't have an answer, in case you were wondering. It's just a question. You, you, you fill in the answer if you think you have one. This child will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The good news is that last week's headlines are the babble of man. And in the midst of all the economic woes and the threats of war and famine and drought and graft and corruption and rigged elections and unjust judges and dishonest courts, there is one, capital O-N-E, who brings to all who will receive him in the midst of all of that an undisturbed calm. Because he's the Prince of Peace. Undisturbed calm in here, not out here. You've heard that saying, sometimes God calms the storm. Sometimes he just calms the heart of his child in the storm. When it says he shall be called, it's saying that's his name. I kind of laughed to myself. I had this moment when I go, I wonder if Mary, once in a while, just to mess with him as a kid, would say, hey, Prince of Peace, come over here. It's his name. Hey, Jesus, you're wonderful. Why, thank you, Mom. The Hebrew understanding of this idea of being called by name is twofold. It's how we identify others. And their name also identifies their character. If you're in a crowd of people and someone calls your name, they'll get your attention. You'll notice them. You'll engage with them. You know, I'm in a group of people. Hey, Joe! Well, hi. You know, and you connect. By the way, that works with the Lord, too. Call out his name. He'll connect with you. When we call on Jesus, he responds to us. Names are personal. God knows our name. Our name identifies us. It becomes a part of our very identity. Jesus called each of his disciples by name. And he renamed a couple of them. Cephas, Peter, Saul, Paul. In Revelation 2.17 and in Revelation 3.5, this significance of names plays out because it's the Lord talking to the churches, and he says, 
the Lord will give a new name to the one who overcomes. And he will not erase our names from his book, but will declare us by name before the Father in heaven and before the angels of heaven. You're going to be introduced by name. You ladies who came up front a little bit ago, a couple of you didn't look all that comfortable being brought up here. You ladies who got the gifts, you know, I, I turned to my wife and I said, they look a little unenthusiastic about being asked to come up front. I get that. So the Lord called me to preach. I did not like standing and talking in front of people. Now they can't shut me up. But he calls you by name. And someday, you're going to be in front of the heavenly hosts and the Father of heaven himself. And Jesus will call you by name. Father, I want you to meet one of ours. His name is Joe. Or Lynn, or Jim, Jay. And I can just see us all kind of like at an AA meeting, saying, hi, Jim. Hi, Jay. <laughs> or clapping, like we did today. By the way, totally blessed me. Thank you for singing. Beautiful. Well, there's power in a name. And it is at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God in heaven. And when Jesus called Lazarus from the tomb, it has been said that he had to say, Lazarus, come forth and name him by name because if he had just said, come forth, since he was the resurrection, everybody that had died would have come out of the tomb. That would have been crowded and awkward. Great power in his name. Call him by name. Prince of Peace. He rules in peace. He rules with peace. And it says, and his peace, right along with his government, will continue to increase. Well, how can you have more peace? Well, there seems to be a lot more trouble in this world, more tumult, so his peace is greater. And keeps pushing back in us against that which would take us out. I'm going to kind of wrap up here with a question. Why do we not have peace then? It's a matter of focus. There's a prayer course that I learned as a teenager. You've probably sang it in more recent times. It's still around. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. It's a matter of focus where we look. If all you do is look at Fox News, there's not going to be much peace. If you look at some of the other news feeds, there'll be even less peace. If you listen to the talking heads on the radio for three hours a day, you won't have a whole lot of peace. Not saying you can't do that. But don't forget to include the King of Peace, the Prince of Peace. Get him into your life. Focus on him, especially when it appears that everything around you is falling apart. It's easy business to preach peace when you are in health and have everything that you want. But the Bible preaches peace when things are in a Howling tumult of passion. This is Oswald Chambers. And sins and iniquity. It is in the midst of anguish and terror that we realize who God is and the marvel of what he can do. The path of peace for us is to hand ourselves over to God and let him search our innermost being to show us where we need to trust him. You see, peace with God in terms of our eternal destiny comes when we accept Christ. But that's just the beginning. There's this life you have to live. And peace with him is something that we have to discipline and practice and focus on every day as we walk this journey. Yes, your eternal destiny is assured. There's this awkward moment between the cross 
and the crown that you have to live every day. And so many of us lose that peace. You know how we can see that we've lost that peace? We get angry, we get upset, we start getting agitated, we, we butt heads with fellow Christians, we castigate and criticize and treat unkindly people that don't know God. Why should it shock us when sinners act like sinners? But listen to what we say about some of our political leaders. Oh, they're a crook, they're a thief, they're that. Well, yeah, they're a sinner. Yeah, I get upset too. I'm not trying to pretend like I'm on some high holy ground here. But every once in a while the Lord reminds me, hey, I'm in charge. Jesus told us to pray for him. I don't like you fill in the blank. Well, then pray about it. It's a matter of focus. The one unmistakable witness that Jesus has promised us is the gift of his peace. Not the peace of sin forgiven that comes when we ask Christ into our lives, but rather it is his peace for living. No matter how complicated our circumstances become, one moment of contact with Jesus and the panic is gone. The emptiness is gone. And his peace is his tranquility fills us. As one little middle school boy put it, when his Sunday school teacher said, describe peace for me. He says, it's when you feel all smooth inside. The evil of this world will wax great. It will increase. The Bible tells us that that is so. and We shouldn't be too shocked about it. But the peace of God from the Prince of Peace never ceases, it increases. It keeps pushing back the tumult of darkness. There will be no end to the increase of his peace. My prayer for all of us is that we will look intently toward Christ in the midst of this season of turmoil and allow him to fill us with his undisturbed spirit. Every day. And I can't speak for you, but for me, I find myself sometimes praying that by the hour. May he fill us more and more until he brings us into his eternal kingdom of peace someday. In the words of Paul in 2 Thessalonians 3.16, may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in Every circumstance, the Lord be with you all. Father God, may your spirit speak strongly into us beyond the words of mortal lips. Amen. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat>